Hi there everyone, my name's Adam Voigt. I'm the founder and the CEO of Real Schools here in Australia and I'm thoroughly delighted to be speaking to you today about my favourite topic which is school culture. Uh, in particular, I guess my passion has become how I can assist schools, how I can partner with schools to be able to use restorative practices as the underpinning feature of their school culture, as the, the hallmark of it, and to allow them to get the benefits of everything that I've had in my career, uh, particularly in school leadership, uh, from committing so holus bolus to the notion of school culture through restorative practices and what the benefits of that are for the key stakeholders in my school. Um, myself, I've been a, a system leader um, as in charge of student behaviour and wellbeing across the, all the Northern Territory here in Australia. I've been a teacher in some truly challenging locations around all the rural and urban areas of Australia and I've been a school principal and I had the opportunity to uh, turn around a school that was really struggling with a high percentage of Indigenous but also of low socioeconomic students and then I was afforded probably the, the opportunity of my lifetime when I had the great opportunity to open a brand new school and to be responsible not only for the functioning of that school but for its design. And what I found was that the design of the architecture of the school needed to take second place to the design of the culture of the school. I started to read heavily. I started to look a lot at what comprised the most successful, the strongest, the most relational cultures, uh, not only locally in Australia, but abroad and in countries where education was seen as a priority and where they were excelling. Um, and what I found was a lot of vagaries. I in fact found one report where there was 88 factors apparently that influence school culture and I thought wow I could just imagine myself walking around every day trying to remember what those 88 factors were as I did my daily work and I needed to simplify it a little bit and so what I've been able to do through real schools is start to develop a model for implementing restorative practices as a feature of our culture that can be reflected upon and that can be replicated from school to school with some simple foci errors and that's what you can see on the screen in front of you at the moment. We focus on language, we focus on conduct, we focus on mindset and when we do what we believe is that we take restorative practices to another level. We're calling it RP 2.0. This notion of school culture has been something that I've become fascinated by for an incredibly long period of time and I think my interest has always been innate and perhaps informal and became more of a focus for me as I had the opportunity to open that brand new school and get to the work of designing that culture. Indeed, these days when I'm running a, a day of training or speaking about restorative practices, I often ask an audience full of educators um, put, to put their hand up if they think that the culture of a school is important. And almost invariably, everybody puts their hand up. The problem comes with the next question when I ask them to keep the hand up because what I'm going to do randomly in just a moment is ask one of the participants in the audience to come out onto the stage with me and to tell everyone what the correct definition of school culture is. Of course, a lot of hands go down at that point. Uh, if any of you outside of Australia have ever seen the fabulous movie The Castle, um, you'll know what I'm about to reference. If you haven't, you really need to go and watch this to get a good idea of what Australia is all about. There's a fabulous scene when a lawyer is confronting uh, the High Court about the constitution of the country. And uh, the judge, one of the judges asks him about the constitution, if he can describe the constitution. He says, well, it's, it's the vibe. And that's what I think happens when we're asked, we ask people to describe the culture of a school. They start to use vague terminology such as vibe and atmosphere and feel. And what I think we need to, we need to identify first around school culture is that if all of us put our hand up and say that the culture of a school is important, and if all of us put our hand down because we're not quite sure what it is, how do we work on it? And so what we've begun with our work at Real Schools is starting to say, how could we define school culture in a way that can be universally agreed upon such that we can begin to work on it? And what we do is define school culture as a behavioural set. So it's basically the sum total, we say, of all of the, the behaviours that are exhibited by all of the key stakeholders in your school. So that's your staff, it's your students, and it's your parent and carer community. Everything they do contributes to the, the big nebulous ball that is your school's culture. But we say that within that big nebulous ball, there are two subsets of behaviours. There are the behaviours that we encourage, the behaviours that we say, that's fantastic, we like that, it lines up with our values, do it again, do it more creatively. 
perhaps occasionally will say have a sticker or a certificate for all that effort. Um, and then there are the behaviours that we tolerate. So these are the behaviours that currently exist in our community, demonstrated by all three stakeholder groups, because perhaps we haven't found the will, the skill or the time to be able to address them using a repeatable methodology such that we can transfer them one by one from the tolerate pile to the encouragement pile and thus get ourselves a more positive school culture. What I'm quick to point out when I'm working with educators about this though, is that they should not make the assumption that schools with the most positive cultures are the ones that have 100% encourageable behaviours and 0% tolerable behaviours. In a school, unfortunately, but really fortunately, we're working with several hundred young people whose brains are unfinished and also working with the people who have the most emotional, irrational connections to them, their parents. Uh, we are going to have conflict, we are going to have disagreement, we are going to have poor behavioural choices that all contribute to our culture. So we should expect that there will always be behaviours in our tolerate pile. Schools that have the most successful cult cultures have simply decided that they have chosen their methodology for how they're going to address those behaviours, of how they are going to give their school the best fighting chance of having a healthy balance between encouragement behaviours and tolerable behaviours. And my contention to all of them is that the very best methodology they can choose is restorative practices done well. We don't always in Australia have schools that implement it well. In fact, in Australia, I think that we have some schools that are reticent to take on restorative practices uh, because they perhaps have heard some not so favourable stories from other schools about the way that restorative practices has been rolled out in their school. And what I think when we're schools we've got in Australia who perhaps take on the notion of implementing a bit of restorative practices do, is that they perpetuate some unhelpful myths around working restoratively. The first myth is that it takes too long. So we hear schools all over the place saying, we'd love to do restorative practices, but the questioning thing and you know, sitting down every time, that it takes too long. And unfortunately, that's a message that they don't, uh, have, that's a myth that we don't dispel often enough by showing them the immense time-saving benefits of working restoratively. I'm going to talk about that when we get to the conduct sphere of the model that you can see on the screen. And then the second thing they tell me is that it's too soft. That it's just, you know, that there's no consequences, there's no punishments, there's no accountability, there's no responsibility. And it takes time to unpack for people that responsibility, that true responsibility comes from learning to take it. Uh, not by enduring a punishment or a, or, or, or a detention. And so what we need to do is not harden our kids to punishment and detention, but we need to make them acutely aware of the way their behaviour affects other people and then give them the opportunity to take responsibility. In fact, stand next to them and support them while they do. And that's what we're trying to get to with the schools that we work with. We're delighted that this model of RP 2.0 has been so successful in being able to help our schools to be able to make that trip and to embark upon a journey that does take time. In fact, at Real Schools, we refuse to run one day training opportunities for schools because we just don't think that does enough. Um, we work with our schools over time, we work in the classrooms, we engage the parents, we help the leaders to be able to build the implementation plans. And we stand side by side as principals who have already done that work uh, in order to make sure that they have a critical friend right the way from the beginning to the very end of that journey where they feel that their culture is giving their, they're giving their programs and their stakeholders an opportunity to thrive. So let's kick off with this notion, first of all, of how we can be restorative about our language. Um, many of you will be familiar in a restorative model of working through what we call effective statements. And that makes a lot of sense for me. Um, the notion that when we, for instance, instead of saying to a student, uh, pick that up and put it in the bin when they drop a piece of rubbish, instead saying, I'm disappointed to see you do that, put it in the bin. It's a quick drive-by, it's a quick hit and run, um, but what it does is it gives us the opportunity to teach empathy. And we talk to our schools a lot about the informal opportunities that they have to multiply the amount of times they use those effective statements and the ways that they can also then collectively start to build empathy in our young people. We talk to them about how you can't learn empathy formally, which means that we believe that by teaching empathy explicitly on a, Friday, on a Wednesday afternoon, you do only a small part of the job of helping to a young person to become empathic. In fact, most of us didn't learn to become empathic people because one night mum and dad sat them down with a PowerPoint about empathy, made sure we were aware of it and that we had done a poster about it. We became empathic because we were immersed in several cultures that demonstrated for us and taught us with outrageous and monotonous regularity 
that our behaviour affects other people. And once people understand that, there's a great opportunity for them to actually do something with that. And we try to make it as fun as we possibly can. But what we first need to do is to sell them on this notion of how language is the most powerful contributor to the culture that they're trying to produce. Language is the most powerful contributor to the culture that they are trying to produce. So what we talk to them about is a quick model that I want to bring up on the screen for you now. And it's this notion that a culture is driven by its language. In fact, language is unique to culture in that it is both an input and an output. So the leaders of the culture, the people who are the grown-ups in a school, they're the leaders of culture. What they need to do is to start to recognise that there is immense choice, there is immense opportunity, and they need to be cognisant of the opportunities that they have to be able to speak in a different way because the speech is what creates the most, but is the most fervent and um, an influential part of that culture. And only then, when young people grow in a culture that is dominated and has been defined by the language that's been inputted by its elders and by its, by, by its leaders, will they emerge as an output of that culture with things like empathy, respect, restraint, self-regulation and moral growth in place. I had a fabulous opportunity in my first principalship. As I mentioned, it was a turnaround job uh, to help a school that was struggling to be able to find its feet and find its identity and begin to thrive and succeed again. I was also incredibly lucky. I um, had a, a staff member called Yalma Yunapingu, who was married to a former Australian of the Year, um, Mandawai Yunapingu, who was a rock star. He was the lead singer of a band called Yothu Yindi. But what a lot of people didn't know about Mandawai was that he was also a former school principal. And so Mandawai, unfortunately, by the time I met him, was ailing and was... Um, was battling very ill health that eventually took his life and he was coming into Darwin regularly where we were located for dialysis treatment and in between his treatments Mandaboy would decide to just hang out in my office which I think you can imagine for a young principal who's trying to find his way in a school with many many indigenous kids in Australia that having an Australian of the year an indigenous man and elder and respected figure sitting in your office for a few hours uh, was going to be an opportunity that I was not going to allow to pass. Uh, we talked a lot about culture and I asked a lot of questions about how I could be of better service to the families in my school community. And one day I ran, pa ran past Bandawoy this notion of me believing that language is both an input and an output of culture. And Bandawoy said to me, he said, you know what, Adam, he said, I think that that, that is the biggest problem we are facing. It's the biggest challenge we're facing in terms of the erosion of the Indigenous culture in Australia. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the old people have stopped telling the young people the stories. He said, no longer are our young people growing in a culture that is defined by the words that its elders speak. I said, right. And he said, and in fact, they're instead being defined by the words that they do hear. I said, what are they? And he said, unfortunately for our US listeners, <laughs> um, he said, it's American gangster rap crap. <laughs> I said, right. And he said, look at them. He said, there are our kids, they're Australian, they're Indigenous kids, but they have baseball hats backwards on, on backwards and, Amer and, um, and NBA singlets on. And they're doing all the destructive things that they hear prophesized in the songs of some of the American rap that they were listening to. And he also pointed out that, unfortunately, a lot of these kids are growing up in homes affected by drugs and alcohol, and that some of the language that they hear is associated with the choices that people make and the words that people say when they're affected by those substances. And how it's not useful, it's not helpful for us to grow, be growing young people in that culture. And so we talk to our teachers about how it is that they can contribute to a culture where the language that's inputted is positive, where they're using affective language as often as they possibly can. And we talk to them about how they can do it with fun. So we encourage them to make games of their, their transitioning from having uh, no effective language, where they might say, hey, you pick that up, to what we call an effective accent, where they just kind of can't help it. It's just a twang that's in the way that they speak now, where they would say, hey, I'm, a fr I'm frustrated to see you do that, put it in the bin. And um, we play games. So one of our schools that we work with, a group, a PLC of year three, four teachers, came up with a fabulous game that they called the 20W Club. And the 20W Club exists where they, uh, they said that they, they walked around all day with lanyards around their necks that had a, each of them had a pen or a texter hanging from that lanyard. And they agreed that every time they used an effective statement, they needed to put a little mark on their hand with the aim of getting to 20. 
And at the end of the day, when the bell rang at 3.30 in the afternoon, the students would scarper from their classrooms and they would meet in the middle in a, in a, in a shared area and put their hand in to see where they were at. And if they had 20, then they were permitted the W, which was wine. <laughs> and they had agreed as a group that they would not drink wine that evening if they had not made it to 20 marks on their hand. I asked them about the experiment and said, how did you, um, how did you go? What did you find out? And they said there were two things. They said, number one, everybody seems to get to 20 fine on a Friday. And I said, right. I said, what else did you find out? And they said, there are some days when you have 19, but you really feel like you need a wine at the end of the day. I said, right. So what happens then? I said, usually somebody runs to the window, opens it up and yells at a student, I'm delighted to see the way you're helping your sister across the road. One more. Um, Gamifying it became something that they realised very quickly that 20 was too low a score. And before they knew what they were up, they were doing 30, they were aiming at 50. And then they gave the game away because they had developed what we called an affective accent. Working on your language is a pedagogical imperative because language is also a significant tool in terms of the pedagogy that teachers use in the classroom and it's practical as well because there's no easier place to start with working restoratively than deciding to just change a few words. The second thing that we focus on is conduct. And there's probably two areas that I want to talk to you about uh, the way that we help schools to be able to focus on the way we conduct ourselves in schools. Now, we're actually quite intentional in not using the word practice here. Uh, I think that a lot of, I think for a long time the word practice has become a little overused in that it sort of washes over, oh yeah, we're talking about our practice again. But when we ask people to think about their conduct, and we ask people to think about what's the conduct that you're using that is the most influential in your classroom, e.g., what does your conduct equal in terms of the student conduct? People start to ponder at a slightly different level. Again, it's a pedagogical imperative, but it starts to become a philosophical choice. We're asking people to think about what they see a teacher to be. Is a teacher an authoritarian figure who stands at the front of the room and tries to force education upon some um, you know, unwilling and, and perhaps reluctant students? Or is a teacher somebody who wants to work with their students towards a common goal that we can all celebrate the attainment of? Is a teacher a person who is just as interested in a, in a student's test results as they are in putting them on a positive life trajectory? Is a teacher just as interested in being somebody who, has a young, who contributes to young people going out into the world capable of navigating relationships and being happy? And so when we start to get beyond just the practice that we use in the classroom and talk about our conduct, we get to a slightly deeper level. What we do is talk about two pieces of conduct. We talk about teachers in terms of the conduct they use when they approach conflict with young people. So we talk to them about the very simple methodology for resolving conflict of going past, present, future. Obviously, there's a lot of notions in there and there's a lot of research that we talk about around how to generate a fair process with those students to be able to attack contact, conduct, uh, conflict fairly. But what we do is say it's a pretty simple, a pretty repeatable methodology for being able to handle conflict. And then we talk to them about who are the students with whom dealing with conflict is the most challenging. Now, most agree with me, and I have to uh, declare a slight gender bias at, at this point. The students that I struggle most around conflict are when there's social group conflicts with girls around the years of about oh, maybe year five to year nine on their journey. As a principal, when a group of year six girls came to me and said, Mr. Voigt, we have a, we have a friendship problem that we need to talk about, I know a couple of things. I know one that that's an hour of my life that I will never get back. I also know that most of the time when those girls leave my office, they leave and I think to myself, I think I made that worse. So what I needed was a way of being able to one, be more efficient with my time and two, be effective with my time. And so I developed a new way of working that, does, that uh, dispelled the first myth I spoke about before of, not, of restorative practices taking too long. On the whiteboard of my office, I put up on the wall, I, I commandeered a space that was scarce in a principal's office. And about the size of an A3 piece of paper, I, I in permanent marker, put three rectangles on top of each other. In the first rectangle, I put P3. In the second rectangle, I put P3. And in the third, I put F3. And as the girls arrived the next time, I said, come in girls, I'm really happy to talk to you. There's a circle of chairs here for you to work in. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna spend, no, we're gonna spend nine minutes talking about this. I could see instantly they were rather taken aback. I said, for three minutes, we're going to talk about the present. 
and I put it on a timer on my iPhone and I said, go girls, tell me what happened at lunchtime today. And they're very good at this. And they tell me things like, you know, she wouldn't have lunch with me. She's left me out. She didn't invite me to the party. You know, she put something nasty on social media about me. She stole my boyfriend. You know, um, and they keep going and the timer goes off. Uh, the girls are very good at being able to fill up the box. But my job is just to write the things that happened. I usually don't even write a person's name. I just write the things that have gone wrong in the past. Um, and I search for what I call the gist. So uh, the reason I cut them off so uh, fervently after three minutes is that I believe that in any, any description, if a lot of words are said, that I can definitely get a gist within three minutes. But what I don't want to do is launch educational CSI um, and spend an hour calling witnesses and getting statements. I want to actually move forward quickly to the notion of fixing this problem rather than just describing it. But at the end of the three minutes, one of the girls will try to stop you from moving on. So she will say to you, but Mr. Void, I haven't told you yet about the way her mum looked at my mum at basketball on the weekend. And I have three harsh and horrible words for that girl. I don't really care. That's four. I don't care. Um, and the point, the truth is, to a large extent, I don't. Because I think that everything that I'm getting beyond three minutes is likely just padding. And it's reflective of the girl's commitment to a previous adversarial system where what you do is you provide precedence, you provide additional briefs of evidence such that you can mitigate the risk of a negative outcome on yourself. And that's not what I'm looking to achieve with the girls. This isn't about negative outcomes and trying to make sure that somebody's better off or worse off than you. It's about fixing problems. I want them to know that I only need a gist of the problem in order to be able to fix it. And so what I'll do then is move on very strictly. I'll press three minutes on my timer again. And I'll say, tell me, girls, how this is making you feel? And they'll tell me that they're feeling upset and they're feeling annoyed and they're feeling frustrated. And I'll write those words. And often they can't fin complete the three minutes because really every girl's only feeling one or, two, one or two things. And so that's fabulous because I get to stop the timer and I save myself an extra minute or two. I then do a little bit of what we call theatrical teaching. I think great teaching is possibly 90% theatre. And I look at that three, those, those words in the, in the second P3 box, in the middle box, I go, that's not good. That's not good. We can't have that in our school. We cannot have you wonderful people feeling that way in our school. We must fix this. So my question to you for the bottom box is this. What are you going to do to fix the problems that we have in the middle box? Every sentence you say here, girls, is going to begin with, I am going to, and not she should, go. I am going to you know, invite her over to my party. I'm going to have lunch with her tomorrow. I'm going to delete this off social media. I'm going to give her boyfriend back, perhaps. Um, and we've got some commitments there that I am able to, as the facilitator of this, or, of the, of this meeting, uh, be able to just follow through on. You see, my intention from here is perhaps to take a photo of that and send it to their homeroom teachers so they don't have to go through this torture with their students again. I might even send it to a couple of parents who might be prone to believing their daughter when she gets home and says that the school didn't do anything about it. And what I want to do is to be able to come on Friday because that's the asterisk that I put next to one of the, one of the actions here, which was my action, which says, I'll come and check in on you on Friday and see if this is done. What I want to do is to be able to take this, this picture to the girls and say, did you do this? And they say, yes, I did. Go, that's fantastic, thank you. And so what we've been able to do now is turn a negative situation into a positive in nine, in nine minutes of my time, plus a little bit of follow-up, such that I now get to thank and congratulate the girls for doing the right thing, rather than listening to them and ticking them off for doing the wrong thing. Thanking and congratulating builds trust in the relationship, and that trust is leverageable for a higher level of performance as we move forward. There are so many wins inherent in tackling conflict in a slightly different way. And the other bit of conduct that we talk about here goes straight to the heart of how we do restorative practices for me. Goes straight to the heart of the power inherent within practicing restoratively in schools. And that's using circles in the classroom. And so I believe that the power in working restoratively in schools is not realized until we allow these principles of working restoratively to reach our, to reach our instructional model. And when we do, teaching, teaching, something happens to teaching that's of incredible benefit to the people who do it. They become more effective and they become less stressed. My belief was that discovering restorative practices as a classroom teacher brought me more sleep at night. And I would like our teachers to sleep better at night. 
And so what we talk about is five different circle types that they can implement. They can implement check-in circles and check-out circles, as many of you will be familiar with who are watching today. Check-in circles are focus on the present to find out where your students are at, to take their social and emotional dipstick and see how much oil you're working with on a particular day. And then a check-out circle to focus on the past, to encourage students to reflect back on performance, to reflect back on ethic, to reflect back on effort that they've provided over a certain period of time. We encourage our st teachers in our partner schools to schedule both check-in and check-out circles. And then we tell them that there are three circles that you can use wherever you like, whenever you see the need, wherever you feel the opportunity. And they are what we call preparation circles, which means that we have a change or a challenge on the horizon. And we want our students to be able to do that challenge well. I talk about the fact that I use preparation circles a lot when I um, when I'm going on an excursion, when I'm taking the students out for the day. Because what I used to do was deliver an awesome sermon. So I could have a busload of 60 students and I could stand up there as they're about to get off at the, at the swimming, um, the, the swimming centre and I could give them 10 minutes of everything that they were to do and everything that they were not to do on that day. And the first thing I told them was, do not forget to take your, your drink bottle off this bus with you. And then I continue for my 10 minutes and 70% of the students get off without their drink bottle because the truth is they weren't listening. In fact, the internal dialogue while I was delivering that brilliant 10 minute sermon was likely something along the lines of blah, 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 blah. Yet if I stood with the students in a circle before we even got on that bus, if I put a whiteboard out, if I put a big piece of butcher's paper out and I asked them, what are the three things we want to feel today? And likely the answers I'm going to get are things around safety and excitement and happiness. Great. Now let's talk about the two things that you would need to do for each of those behaviours to get them. We have a co-created plan for how we want to feel, what the affects are that we wish to experience on the excursion, and we have six behaviours that will allow us to get it. And I can ask the students to turn to the student next to them before we get on the bus and talk about which is the one of these behaviours that you're already is a superpower for you, which you're brilliant at, and which, you, which is your kryptonite. What are you going to have to work on today to make sure that we have a successful excursion? And they get on the bus more capable of being able to do that, to have a great day. We then talk about our fourth circle type, which is a response circle, which can be, we can respond after the excursion. We can get the butcher's paper out again and assess our class in terms of how we went out of 10. Uh, we can also respond to things that didn't happen. And in fact, we've been working with many schools around coronavirus lately. Um, and their responses to that, and we have teachers all over Australia using response circles to help their students get out of a limbic emotional state and into a neocortex state by responding to what they're hearing and feeling and thinking so that they can actually focus on their learning at school. And then the final circle we talk about is learning circles. And this is the opportunity to deliver instruction through, through circles, to move, to change the architecture of our classrooms to take teachers away from having to stand at the front of the room in an authoritarian position, trying to force their students to learn. Because unfortunately, what we do as teachers when we stand in authoritarian positions is that we teach our students, we tell our students that we are in charge and therefore you don't even need to try to control your behaviour. You, there is absolutely no need for a student with an authoritarian teacher to self-regulate. And so therefore primary teachers who perhaps take their students and put them in a clump on the floor. We talk about being quite anti-clump in our restorative work because there are special places in that clump. The students, where are the students sitting who most wish to answer a question? Right at the front. Where are the students sitting who most need to answer a question? They're at the back and the edges. We talk to secondary teachers about not accepting the architecture of the classroom when they walk in for period three as having to be with students seated in rows as though the class is some sort of battlefield. That they can walk in and put the tables to the edges so the students have a low distraction environment when they're working individually. And all they need to do is turn their chairs around to create a big circle whenever we need to provide instruction or content. That they can accept that. They can, they, or they, can, they don't have to accept the rows, but they can say, I want to choose an architecture for my classroom that allows me to work with my students in an authoritative position rather than an authoritarian position where I have to try and make these young people do their learning. And it's incredibly exciting when schools choose that that's the path they're going to take. The final domain of um, working restoratively is a restorative mindset. And for me, this is about two big abandonments. First of all, it's about take abandoning any attachment to outcome. Um, this has been something that it's taken me, I think, a good 20 years of working restoratively to be able to work out 
and that is that the result of a lesson, the result of an interaction, the outcome of my work is not my responsibility. And I talk about a story where a young fellow called Dominic who had an incredibly difficult um, upbringing and uh, he was five years old and the word explosive was all over his psych report as I saw him and met him on a particular day. And we talked about the fact that we sit down and sat down in a circle and did a learning circle and Dominic went into orbit and he was walking around the room kicking over chairs. Um, but slowly Dominic's orbit contracted and he got closer and closer to the circle and I saw his teacher gasp for Dominic had not entered into any learning in that classroom in the first five weeks that he had been placed in that, in that environment. And Dominic put his knee between two students and he nudged to one side as though he wanted that student to make room. And at that point, it could go either way. It really could. You know, um, the student could react the wrong way, I could react the wrong way, and Dominic could become explosive and this becomes a bad lesson. Um, but it's not a bad lesson. Uh, Dominic, whether Dominic explodes or not is not my responsibility. My responsibility is to put the conditions in place that he's got a chance to be successful. And the student looked at Dominic strangely, but she shuffled to her right and Dominic squeezed into the circle. The next opportunity for it to go haywire came again. Um, I asked which, would any of the students like to join me in the circle for uh, the next maths activity that we were doing. And Dominic's hand shot up and I thought, what do I do? You know, do I pick him because he's finally here and doing the right thing? Or do I pick some of these other students who've been sitting here doing the right thing for the last 15 to 20 minutes? And here's what I think. There is no right answer to that question. We follow our gut and we, take, we, we, we use our professional instincts to come up with the best possible answer. And I made him wait. He didn't like it. He huffed, his chin went down and his fists were bald. And um, unfortunately, Dominic, um, or fortunately, I should say, Dominic hung in there. And by the time I got to ask again for another volunteer, he shot his hand up and I asked him to come out and join in. His teacher took a photo and when we discussed it later, his teacher was in tears about the fact that he'd finally joined in, um, which I thought was fabulous. But I also thought it was incredibly lucky um, because it could have gone either way in either circumstance. And for me, I'm curious about whether Dominic does react well or poorly to the conditions I've put in place, but I will not be judging myself on it. I'm curious, but I do not judge myself on what the outcome of my work is. I reflect as heavily as I possibly can upon whether I had done put the conditions in place. And if I had, if I'd done the work that I needed to do to help Dominic to be able to be successful and he still blew it up, it's just interesting, but it's not my fault. Um, if I hadn't given him the chance by deploying practices that were authoritarian and daring Dominic to blow up, then sure, I should be reflecting on the outcome being a, being a reflection of my work. But our jobs as teachers is not to be successful every single time. Our jobs as teachers is just to put the conditions in place where success is possible, where success in fact is likely. If we do that, then I think we do a fabulous thing. And the final thing that I want to talk to you about today is the abandonment of any of our attachment to the adversarial system. If we can as teachers, believe that adversarial systems are, bu are, are built with a judicial intention, which means that we're looking for crime and punishment. And that crime and punishment is a fabulous way to prevent crime. It really is, because let's be honest, even the death penalty prevents that person from, from committing future crimes. But we can take students and prevent them from working, fr from doing the wrong thing. We really can. We can detain them at lunchtime and make sure they don't have access to other people. But we have to ask ourselves, will it increase the likelihood of them doing it again when they get back out there? We can suspend them. We can send them away from everybody that's in the environment. We can even expel them from time to time and make sure that they do absolutely no more harm in our environment. Um, great prevention strategy, not a great learning strategy. And so what we teach our partner schools to understand is that working restoratively is about adopting a learning system for a learning environment, not a judicial system for what should be a learning environment. The fit is better when we decide to use our mindset, which is both a practical and a philosophical objective, to be able to create an environment where young people have the best possible chance to thrive. And that happens when we say to ourselves, I'm not I'm gonna spot it in myself. When I deal with conflict or when lessons don't go well, I'm gonna spot it in myself that I feel the need to punish because I was raised in such a system myself. But I'm not gonna act upon, I'm not gonna act upon it because I don't need that system anymore in order to teach my young people, uh, not only to teach them in terms of academia, 
but to teach them also in terms of becoming a wonderful citizen for the future, which is what their parents are, are looking for as well. So what I'd like to do to finish today is to share with you a story of a school that has done the walk, has done, the, has, has, has done this journey. Um, this is a little bit about Cannonall Primary School. Real Schools has improved the community at Cannonall immensely. It's provided trust between families and us trust between us and the students, trust in our staff, in one another. It's just benefited everybody greatly and I'm really glad that I was part of that journey. Real School's journey has been absolutely awesome. So many facets that have benefited from our work with Real Schools. So we're up to our third or fourth year with our journey with Adam. Uh, so the learning that's taken place has been enormous in that space. In the last Three years, our NAPLAN results have been through the roof. So our growth in our school has been incredible, um, so much so that we're getting other schools asking us, what is it that's happening down there for you to achieve the results you're getting? Over a three year journey, we want to improve the satisfaction level of all three stakeholder groups, and we've done that at Canada. Uh, the teachers are more engaged and even retention of staff has been a real positive at, at Cannonall Primary School. The students in terms of their social outcomes as well as that what they feel about the school and the climate of the school should increase and it has. And also the parents should feel more connected to the school. You walk around the classrooms, you don't hear any teachers yelling, you don't hear any kids yelling. One of my daughters describes one of the teachers' classrooms as having zen qualities. No, I've got no idea where she, she learnt about them, but it, it accurately describes that particular teacher. You know, he never raises his voice. He doesn't have to. To me, that's fantastic. I had a one, two, three class this year. Lots of different age groups in, in that and abilities. But I must say it's probably one of the nicest classes I've had socially because these children have grown up with restorative practices at school. They know nothing different. Um, and I think that has, for me, been the icing on the cake. It's given us a framework to work in. All teachers know that system, and probably more importantly, the kids know the system. A simple system, I think, but it just works. The children are probably getting more involved in their feelings, and they know that a teacher's there to support them. The kids are more open to discuss their problems. Kids that you wouldn't think would do that are doing that now. So that's been really positive. These are now kids who don't step into unhealthy conflict. They step into healthy conflict resolution. They care. They think about their behaviour before they do it. And if they screw up, they know how to fix it up. And they do it in meaningful and productive ways. And it builds young people who are creative. It builds young people who have a moral compass and who know how to listen to their conscience. It's really cool to watch. The Real Schools partnership is a commitment that the school makes between ourselves and Real Schools. Initially there was a series of PD sessions with staff, but where the difference comes into it is that Adam has also come in and worked with staff in the classrooms. So he's either um, mentored or he's taken sessions and, and he's been the person that they can then learn from with him taking the session, or he's sat in the background and said, you know, next time you can do this or you can do that. It's great having the online resources there. If there's something we're not sure about or we want to get better at, like our little mini circles or check-ins, there's the videos of Adam. The other component is that we've run parent sessions to try and educate them on the process and to bring them up to speed with what we're trying to do as a school through our partnership. It was great to be invited to the parent sessions. Adam's so approachable. He's been a teacher, he's been a principal, he knows what works, he knows what doesn't work. I partner with schools because it lights me up to see them get the full benefit of partnership and the full benefit of being able to focus on culture. Whenever I ask school leaders do they think school culture is important, they put their hand up. When I ask them what it is, they get nervous. <laughs> so we're not exactly sure how to define it and if we're not exactly sure how to define it, how do we work on it? So what we provide is a vehicle for schools to be able to work on the most important part of their work, which is creating a culture where young people thrive, where teachers thrive, and where parents support you in what you're looking to try and get done. Um, when that happens, uh, I couldn't think of a better job on the planet to be doing. Cannonock for me is a family, a community. It's a place where I put my heart and soul into. I've always come in and, and done that bit extra because the teachers are putting all their effort and energy into our kids. I'm happy to put energy into the school to make it a great place for the kids and the parents and the teachers. 
to make it an all round great place to go. So send your kids here. <laughs> I am so immensely proud of Principal Michael Block and everything that they've done at Cannonock Primary School to become a school that was in the top 3% in terms of violent interactions in the schoolyard to a school with one of the safest and most relational, uh, most relational environments. Not only an environment at the school, but something that has permeated its entire school community. If you'd like to know more about this approach and how we can um, how we can bring the notion of RP 2.0 to your schools. Uh, we've written a book on this on the subject called Restoring Teaching, which has the intention to restore not only the status of our teachers in the community as a profession that young people really want to step into for the respect in which uh, all of its members are held, but it's also about how you can do this restoring stuff in your teaching as a means to make yourself more effective and less stressed. Um, you can find links to this at our website at realschools.com.au and also at my website at adamvoigt.com.au. I thank you so much. I've really enjoyed being able to pull this together for you today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got something from it. I hope you'll come along to the Q&A session as well. And I really hope you enjoy all of the other presentations at this conference. I'm sure they're going to be absolutely incredible and I'm looking forward to devouring some of them myself. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.